started here. Let's begin talk more. Yeah. All right, it's 12 5. So let's get started. Uh, welcome to the second last lecture for the course. But in terms of new material, this is the last lecture. So we'll stop wherever we stop today is the course that you will see in your final exams. That's the also going to help you solve all your homework problems. And then on Wednesday, uh, we will mostly do like kind of a review, some you know things to learn about exam three. Uh, and then I'll just discuss some advanced topics like you know numerical simulations and so on that we unfortunately did not have time to go through during the uh, time to go through during the course. And importantly, I want to highlight how you can take whatever you have learned even in numerical settings. So we have obviously focused a lot on analytical solutions, but I want to really emphasize that all of the learning here is not just for analytical stuff. It is actually even more important for numerical stuff as I will talk about more uh, next next lecture, okay? So some quick announcements. Um, practice conceptual questions have been, have been posted, much like exam two. There are about 10 to 12 questions, which just, you know, for you to understand about different, you know, um, concepts and their, also their solutions. I've also posted the in-class questions. So let me just write it here as well, including today's. So in-class in have also been posted. And all of this is in the practice, exam practice tab. Like there must be a tab which has this exam practice material or something like that, where you'll have all of these things. Then we have also posted in a practice exam. Similar to this exam, it'll be two hours. So, you know, you can just kind of test out what, what uh, it looks like. Uh, same style again, conceptual questions. But instead of one long problem, we'll have two medium long problems. We're like two different concepts. Uh, and, um, and so you, you'll have an idea from the practice exam. And then the final supplementary video have, has been posted. That's going to help you with the last problem of this homework, which is what we'll also cover today. Okay, so that's also, that, that'll help. It's a little bit more advanced, so don't try to solve the entire thing, but can kind of uh, help you solve the homework problem, which is much easier, okay? So uh, homework problems definitely easier, okay? Any questions on announcements? Anything about homework practice? Anything like that? All good? All right. Uh, then uh, I'll have office hours today for the homework specifically, and then when it's day, so please feel free to you know drop by any time, one hour uh, from the lecture. And feel free will have office hours on Wednesday for the homework, from 3 to 5 p.m. in one D115, uh, which is the room for the homework. And then on Friday for just exam practice, uh, you will you can also, uh, if you want to kind of stop by and uh, talk to Felipe and learn anything, that'll be 3 to 4 30. Okay. Uh, and then finally, I've already reminded you, I know I've bothered you enough times, but please do fill out FCQs. If you haven't done that, uh, it, you know, it, it's just very helpful for. Uh, for us uh, in the future courses. Okay, any questions on homework, FCQs, anything like that? Anything you want to discuss? All right, so just some final things. As I mentioned, we will uh, do the Wednesday's lecture with the course review, exam review, and some advanced topics, numerical topics specifically. Finally, uh, I want to get a quick poll. I I'll send out the time, details, everything by, by Zoom for the, uh, the office hours for exam three. So just before the exam, uh, if you want to kind of have any questions, so the exam is on Sunday uh, at, um, I believe at 1.45 is what when you said the exam is uh, 1.45 p.m. Uh, but any uh, preferences whether to do it at Saturday evening or Sunday morning? Sunday morning. So uh, how many of you would like to do it Saturday evening? It will be via Zoom, so you can all join from anywhere. Saturday evening, or is there an exam on Saturday? That's why I wanted to check. Yes. 1.30. 1.30. So it's probably too early to do it Saturday evening, I guess, for most of you, or would you like to do it on Saturday still? Sunday, Sunday. Sunday morning? Sunday morning works. How many of you want Sunday morning? Can you just raise your hand so that I... And how many of you want Saturday evening? Okay, so Sunday morning have outnumbered. <laughs> Saturday will do it at Sunday morning, but I'll do it early morning, so that it's not close to like 1 p.m., okay? I'll probably do something like 8 a.m., 8.30 a.m., just because I don't want it to be very close to the exam um, for those who, who may want this sometime. Okay. So I'll send out a time, Zoom link and everything, um, and we'll do it Sunday morning, okay? Just based on, like, it seems Sunday morning is more preferred. Any, any questions on the exam, officers? Okay. All right, perfect. 
So uh, that's about it for the all. Uh, um, I do have one question for you all. How many of you want to have the YouTube videos activated beyond the course? So if you if you want, so you want to have the link uh, beyond the course as well. Okay. So I what I will do is once the course is wrapped up, I may send out because I have gotten a lot of questions about having those videos, but they are right now they are like unlisted, so not everybody has access. But I do want to post them for like everyone to see and so on. So I'll reach out and I will make sure we kind of have an agreement because, um, but we'll, we'll make sure that you have available lectures beyond the course so that you can just watch them whenever you want. Okay. All right. Just, I just wanted to get a quick sense. All right. So let's review where we left. So we will finish chapter 15 today from Dean's book. Uh, again, to remind, this is about electrolyte transport. Uh, we had discussed this a few times now. We have focused on this new term called electromigration, which is because of the electrical force. We have discussed how this phi is the this uh, phi is the electrical potential. And because we have added a new variable, we need a new equation, and that equation is the Poisson's equation. Poisson's equation. Okay, so that's essentially what you do. If you know the velocity. Uh, you can solve the problem completely. You can determine C and phi, but it's very complicated. So what we do is we simplify the system in electroneutrality. So remember that rho E is equal to zero is electroneutrality. Okay, electroneutrality. Uh, and for binary electrolyte, that is Z plus Z minus D plus D minus, no convection, 1D. We calculate how the two ions want to stay together and they de develop this ambipolar diffusivity and effective diffusivity, which is able to take care of all the effects together, right? So this is what happens for the uh, two ions. And then we also mentioned that if the diffusivity is a constant and the system is electroneutral, then we can calculate the current, which looks like a resistive system where this is the conductivity kappa. Okay, so this was the conductivity. So this is how I wanted to classify in your mind. Rho E is equal to zero, electroneutral system, two scenarios. Amipolar diffusivity for, uh, for a two ion case 1D and the, uh, the, the ele uh, electrical current per unit area looks like it goes greater the potential similar to a resistive element. Okay, so these two factors. So because this is a complicated topic, it can become challenging to kind of see all these equations. I wanted to kind of, okay, these are the equations, rho E equal to zero or electroneutral, Two, two, case, two results, okay? So that's, that's one part. The second part we focused on last time was case two, where when charge density is not zero, we discussed how for no convec convection and one is to one electrolyte and one D system, you can derive a Boltzmann distribution. Okay, so remember that this was the Boltzmann distribution, the one that I'm highlighting now. And the meaning of Boltzmann distribution was it's a balance of electromigration and diffusion, right? So let's just, just so that I, I want to make sure all of you are kind of remember this. If this is a positively charged electrode, then the negative charge, negative ions will increase. Positive, positive ions will decrease near the surface, right? So when we're discussing that the negative ions increase towards the electrode and why don't all of them go towards the electrode? Because there's also diffusion. Diffusion is trying to push negative ions away from the surface. And the positive ions, they don't all just go away from the uh, electrode. There's, there's some still a gradient because diffusion wants it to go towards the electrode, whereas the electrostatic wants to go, to go away from the electrode. Okay, so there's a balance. Boltzmann distribution is essentially a balance of diffusion and electromigration. Okay, so we derived this equation and we got to this point, which is known as the Boltzmann equation. And for small potentials, small potentials, we showed how this equation yields a Debye length. A Debye length, Debye length, and we discussed how Debye length is generally small, and we found a solution which was the exponential decay solution here. Okay, now in your homework problem, what you are doing in your homework problem is so your homework four six problem four is actually saying what if you don't make that assumption that potential is small, 
what will happen if the potential is large? So you actually go and solve, start to solve the system for a large potential in, in your homework. Okay, so in the class, you've done the small potential limit, but in your homework, you do the large potential limit. Okay, that's point number one. And so you, boundary conditions remain the same, and there's some, some, some small change coming towards the end, but boundary conditions remain the same. You get this answer, and then we consider the charge within the double layer. So the charge within the double layer can be calculated by charge within double layer can be calculated by taking the integral of the density. And this is charge per unit area, by the way. So per unit area, don't forget. This is per unit area. And so you can calculate that. You can put the value of rho E. Remember that rho E is C plus F into C plus minus C minus DX, right? And you can show it, it becomes this number. Uh, or you can basically remember that rho E is minus epsilon d square phi by dx square and you can use that integral to make that uh, formula you can also derive it using either either way either you can go by the use of concentration or you can use a shortcut where you can substitute the Poisson equation integrate it and get the result i in your exams or in your homework i don't want you to be doing all of this integration of rho e dx you can remember there are two things i want you to remember one is that surface charge is the opposite of the double layer. Okay, so whatever charge is in the double layer, so surface charge is equal and opposite to the charge on the double layer. Charge on double layer. And more importantly, QS is given by N epsilon N dot grad phi where n is unit vector into the fluid. At the surface, yes, absolutely, at the surface. Okay, so this is how you should remember this. So why am I saying this? Because this is now almost like a, 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 a result where you are kind of putting the value of a gradient of the potential. Okay, so if your potential is a constant value or a constant flux, like we had discussed, it's kind of like a flux, right? N dot grad phi is like a flux to the potential. So this is the other condition that you should remember is surface if you get this. Okay, let's just quickly try to understand this. I want to see if you are, are seeing this. Okay, sorry, not X like this. So let's say we have these two surfaces, okay? And I am told that Q and this is X is equal to zero. This is X is equal to L. Then, and this is QS and this is QS also. So what are my boundary conditions now at both surfaces? Does anybody want to suggest what will be my boundary condition on the left surface using this formula for phi? It will be QS is equal to epsilon unit vector N is equal to EX, right? So it will become QS is equal to epsilon del phi by del X at X is equal to zero. Okay. Now, what would be my boundary condition on the other side? Anybody want to suggest? Opposite, right? Because normal is now pointing to the negative. So this will become QS is equal to minus epsilon del phi by del X at X is equal to L. Okay. So don't forget this boundary condition. The reason is because you will use this on a spherical system in your homework six problem three. Okay. So you will use this in your homework six problem three. Right, so you will use this, yeah. So if the field, the surface is positive, 
did I did I miss a negative sign? Is what you're saying? I think you're saying there should be negative here, right? Um, just make sure. Yeah, I think that you're right. So it should be all the way negative. Maybe I just missed from my notes. Yeah, I forgot a negative sign everywhere. So let me just correct it everywhere. Thanks, Felipe. Um, let me just make sure I'm. This is correct. Delta by delta x will be negative, and then, yeah, there should be a negative sign everywhere. So here we we'll, we should get a minus n dot minus n dot grade phi, and so this will become negative. The process remains the same, but the sign will be reversed. Okay. So the sign will be reversed, and for that we'll have there is an epsilon here. Uh, I should just correct this here. And here also there is an epsilon. Okay, yeah, thanks. This is this looks correct. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, yeah, that is correct. Yeah. So the main problem was I was just carrying the boundary condition sign wrong everywhere. So basically, it's minus at current n dot alpha rather than plus. So that was the, that was the error. Uh, but the 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 whole definition of unit vector going into the fluid and QS being minus QDL is all correct. So I, I was just missing a negative sign in the boundary condition. But this is still like a constant flux condition. Okay? Don't forget that. Any other questions here? This also falls out like the main step of the important equation. Sorry. Yeah, you can get this as a result also from the integration, but it's just uh, because we have been doing it in one D, we'll have to use divergence theorem to get to the vector form. So, but yeah, this is in the vector form. So, this is this will be true, let's say, in a radius system as well. So, you don't have to worry about integrating or anything like that. You just always get that result. So, so in a spherical geometry in homework system problem three, you you are asked to kind of use this as a boundary condition. So, just kind of we can use this as any other questions? All right. So one thing I, I mentioned. So so let's so let's just recap. Okay. So Poisson Planck equation when rho is equal to zero, ambipolar diffusivity and the current result. Now when your rho is not equal to zero, I want you to remember that there's a Boltzmann distribution, a Debye length, and then what are the boundary conditions? That's all. Okay. Other boundary conditions. The difference is now instead of a resistive system, this becomes a capacitive system. Because your charge is proportional to your charge is proportional to potential drop. Charge is proportional to potential drop. Okay. So, so charge is proportional to potential drop. And so that's how you get the you get this value. All right. So when you do this derivative here, you can you get out an epsilon by lambda. And we had discussed why this is very important in supercapacitors is because lambda is very small. And when lambda is small, your capacitance is big. Right, because it's epsilon by lambda, and that's why you call, these are called supercapacitors, where you have an electrolyte. Here, electrolyte basically the double layer. Let's say there's a charge QS here. Then there's a double layer ions which is, are negatively charged and positively charged surface. Then this is like one plate of the capacitor, and this electrolyte is in other other plate of the capacitor. Right, so that is what we had discussed last time. But now remember that all of this assumes that the potentials are small. Like this F5 by RT is small. In your homework, we ask you to do F5 by RT is large. Okay. So before we move further, let's just do a quick poll and try to understand physically what happens when you have the large potential. Okay. So let's do this quick poll. What do you think? Uh, Debye Huckel is the small potential limit, by the way. So if you're not if you're not seeing the Debye Huckel is what you have already done. Okay. If the potential is now large, phi is five. What do you think? Would would I get? So this is my usual one. So solution A is what you have derived. B is whether it decays, it is faster or it is slower. As you try to think, A is what you have already done for small potentials. Would it be faster or would it be slower than the than the small potential limit? And for that, I want you to kind of look at your equations. Uh, there is a cinch of F5 by RT that you had simplified. So look at the equation and try to kind of reason out. And it's all approximate. And I'll tell you how to think about this uh, a bit more. Okay.
by the way this is not something will you will you solve a little bit in your in your uh, homework but essentially this is called the non linear limit where now you have a cinch you don't simplify it to linearize it it's a non linear limit which is called okay, so let's wait for another uh, maybe 15 seconds so that everybody can get their answers in and then we'll take a look All right, so I'll close the poll now in case anybody wants to get their answers in. All right, let's close the poll. Let's look at the results. So it's split completely. Uh, and uh, one, some of you are slower, some of you are faster. The answer it decays faster than the by occur. Uh, and to understand that mathematically, I'll just give you a very simple mathematical reason. Don't overthink it. Basically, the point is that your cinch starts to blow up, right? When you increase phi, when you increase start to phi, if you continue to increase phi, it starts to become larger and larger and larger. And the second derivative means the curvature, right? So the curvature is larger and larger and larger. And the curvature is larger when you have a more steeper drop than the, than the slower drop. So that's the, that's the mathematical reason. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a good good. So what what someone is saying is if the if there is uh if there is a higher tidal pull in board, that's correct. The only thing is would it be proportional or would it be non-linear? <laughs> so the answer is yes, it will pull more and more, but it also pulls like that that the, the increase becomes higher and higher. So the pulling because the pull is the exponential. So it's a very good physical intuition is that the pull is exponential. Look at this, this is a exponential. So if I start to go towards large values, I'm really trying to pull all the negative ions towards that. So that's why your concentration, your becomes thin. Yeah, that's also another way to look at it. Okay, but the so basically the point is that it becomes non-linear. So you can you can kind of get to the the answer is C. Okay, it gets faster than the huckle Now this is an unphysical limit because what happens is that you can make potential infinity now. You can keep adding potential. And the system is saying it will keep on increasing the concentration, right? If I start to keep adding potential, okay. So let's say you're increasing your potential more and more. This one here, the the phi here. If I continue to increase this, I'm depleting more and more positive ions and continuing to add more and more negative ions. So what the problem is? Then this shouldn't be fine. Like, is there any problem with this sort of formula? Any, any thoughts on what could what it could be what could it be missing? So the what happens is that and this is not very difficult to see. Let's say your concentration is about hundred millimolars, right? Then you start to predict values like hundred molars or fifty molars, which are physically unrealistic, right? Because your exponential can blow up very fast. So what happens is that if you call this in the in all of these assumptions. You're assuming that your ions are represented by a concentration. So at each location, there are thousands of ions. Right? It's a continuum approximation. And so basically what happens is you are not accounted for the finite size of the ion. And that is essentially a problem with this model. So if some of you are going to do electrochemistry, you may be encountering this formula may not work because this is sort of really sort of simplifying the system. But if some of you are doing zeta potential measurements or colloidal science literature, this is fine because their charges are not that high, concentrations are not that high. Okay, so just remembering that kind of uh, factor is important. That uh, this is more true for colloidal side, but for electrochemical side, you have to account for corrections. Okay, so one of the corrections is called the stern layer, and that correction is essentially something that you will do in your homework. Okay, so remember that. And then a second correction is. Something that I actually, this is how I got in this entire field. I did this in my postdoc. So one of my papers essentially started to kind of look into different effects of how these ions kind of arrange around the system and it's called the structure of the double unit. How are these ions kind of organized around it? There are sometimes effects like the cost, the epsilon value that we treat constant in the course is actually not really constant. So it changes, it's called dielectric decrement, the size of the ion, like I mentioned, the valence of the ion. So there are many effects that go on. And basically that can, you know, uh, 
that can happen. So there are there are people who do molecular dynamic simulations of electrical double layers, which is very active area of research. Uh, and uh, one of my papers in a postdoc, the second paper actually focused more on the there is a molecular dynamic simulation and then there are continuum models. So they should agree with each other. Shouldn't be like diverging. So how to bridge that gap? And then, like I mentioned earlier, pre phase thesis, PhD thesis focused on charging of electrical double layers inside porous electrons. So all of this is in, in free space. But when you start to add confinement, things start to break again. So you kind of have to take into account those effects as well. Okay, so these are kind of some modern ideas that are continuing to go around in this sort of space. Okay. Questions on electrical double layers. Okay. So electroneutrality, amplitude of diffusivity, and current. Whenever we have electrical double layers, charge surface, think of capacitor and the poisson boltzmann results okay with boundary conditions that's that's the way i wanted to think about the subject all right all right let's go further and then we'll introduce this new topic now which is the final topic is that we have discussed this part of electrophoresis and diffusive forces and i want to again replay this video so that you can remember what we're talking about initially we first have these parking spots for dna they put these dna's we spark them on the spot there is currently no electric field and then slowly there will be an electric field towards the end of this video. Um, as the electric field started, this stretches it out. Okay. So there's a stretching out of this particle with the electric field, or you can have a concentration gradient, which can essentially start to bring these particles in in a in a region where they shouldn't go. In the y direction, there is no flow, zero flow. But the particles are going inside very fast. This is actually real-time video. Uh, and they are going fast because of the flow created uh, because of the particle motion created by the uh, by the electrolyte in the background. Okay, so the question really is, uh, let's say if I have the surface positive Q on the right hand. So these are this is obviously a complex system. Let's try to simplify it. If I have a particle Q, what do you think? What what would happen to the negative ions? They will go closer to the surface, right? And the positive ions will be repelled. That's what that's what we have discussed. But remember that when they're coming closer to this, so they, let's imagine that they have come closer to the surface and the, uh, the, the negative ions and positive ions are repelled. Now I add an electric field to the system. Okay. Would the ions, add, would the ions uh, interact with the electric field? Yes. Would the particle interact with the electric field? Yes. And so what happens is that because of this additional electric field, Essentially, these ions and the particles start to interact with each other, and there is fluid flow because of that. So that's what the last topic is. Until now, we were in, ignoring convection. We were saying it's purely diffusive system, like amphiphoric diffusivity, or static system where there is a balance of diffusion electromigration. But now we will discuss this case where uh, ions can actually create flow. Okay, so that's basically the last part, which is called electrokinetic flows. Okay, so let's the last part of the course. The topic is called electrokinetic flows. Electrokinetic flows. Okay. And so the the so the, there is some math here, but the main point I really want you to make sure you all of you understand is why there is a flow to begin with. Okay. So let's start the problem here. Is we were thinking about a positively charged surface plus Q. We were saying there's some negative ions that will come towards it. Okay. What do you think will be the, the currently there is no electric field. Okay. What do you think would be the length of this length of this cage like a where the region is charged? Do you, do you like what I'm trying to ask is which what is the length scale that will determine how big is this charge region? Divide length, right? Because currently we have just moved from this flat plate to a spherical geometry. So divide length. We have not added any electric field. Okay. So this is the lambda. Okay. So we have basically added this is the lambda. Now, the main, first point I want to mention, and then we are adding this electric. We'll add electric field, but assume assume lambda by a is much smaller than one. Okay. So let's assume it's very small. I hope you will all agree is that I can think of this as a flat plate now. Flat plate now with some sort of a lambda. 
right? Because I can sit on the surface and I will not see all this curvature. I will just see a flat line because it's so thin that I don't see the curvature, right? So that's the idea. It's very small. I can change my coordinate systems to X and Y to make my life easy. And I can assume that the particle is stationary. Particle is stationary. In reality, the particle will move, but let's imagine the particle is stationary and the fluid will move. Okay. Stationary. So th this is just some assumption to make our life easier. But this is what I want to first focus on. And then the question is, now I added an electric field here, E infinity. Or let's call it E naught just to... Probably infinity is better. E infinity here. We have added some electric field. So the question I have for you is, I have said the particle is stationary. There is some ion nearby, positive, negative, and so on. Negative here. The one positive goes inside, and then positive, negative, positive, negative outside this double layer. Then the question really is, why do you think? Will do you think there will be some fluid flow? That's what I'm going to ask. So. We have essentially said we understand the double layer. We understand that if there is a stationary surface, how the charges will accumulate. There will be negative charges towards the positive surface, positive charges will be repelled, and then basically we form a double layer. Right? We understand the capacitive, we understand how to do the Boltzmann distribution, we understand that. But now I'm saying I've added an electric field on top of that. What do you think? Why do you think there should be a fluid flow at all? Any, any thoughts? So, so you're going in the right direction. So it's a very good answer. So the answer is that the, uh, the ions are sort of responding to the electric field. So good, good, good sort of fact. But I want to further push it further. Do you think the ions outside the double layer would get an attract uh, would get any importance because of the electric field, or do you think they are due to the electric field, or do you think they are not as important? So why do you think they are get important? So remember, we are not thinking in terms of individual ions; we are thinking in terms of concentration in ordinary state. So is there any charge outside? Is neutral, right? Outside the double layer, it's neutral. So if I apply electric field, is there going to be any force? No force, right? So all of you agree that there is no force outside. However, inside here, there is a net negative net negative charge, right? Do you all agree? Neg negative charge. So the force is going to be opposite towards the electric field. So I'll apply a opposite electric field force here. And the question is, if it is the only force, then I will get a creation of this, all this liquid. That's not going to happen because as you discussed, this is small and large numbers, all that scale, there is no acceleration. So there has to be a counterbalance force, right? So this electric force is a double layer. And how will you generate a counterbalance force? What is that force called? Shear stress, right? So you need to have a shear force to balance this electric force. I know that the velocity here is zero because stationary. So I will develop a velocity gradient to kind of balance this electric force in the system. And this is called the electroosmosis effect where the particle is stationary and the fluid is moving. The left hand side is called electrophoresis, where the particle is moving and the fluid is stationary. It's just a matter of reference. Okay. So this gradient in velocity develops. Velocity develops to balance Fe. Okay. So that's the idea. The gradient in velocity develops to balance Fe. Okay. Make sense? Any questions there? Yes, yes, absolutely. This is called electroosmosis. And this is called electrophoresis. 
By the way, the entire DNA jelly electrophoresis is, uh, is used for separation of sizes is based on this phenomenon. That how you kind of separate it, separate different entities based on sizes because of electric field application. How many of you have used a zeta potential measurement, zeta sizer? Yes, so a few of you have used it. That uses all of this principle. It's exactly this. Zeta sizer based is works on this principle. Okay. And it's a very common technique uh, to kind of you know measure measure charge in a particle. So uh, physically, is this clear? So but basically, the idea is because of the double that is net charge that exceeds the force, you have to balance that force to kind of create the uh, create the uh... so. By the way, I have not discussed the sign of the velocity yet. So we will discuss which which sign, which direction should the velocity um, uh, the velocity be. The velocity is just arbitrarily written there. We'll we'll come to that in a second. Okay. So this is the this is the this is the question. Uh, this is the problem we want to solve. Now, so now the basic idea is this: is that our governing equations we know for the fluid flow are del C I by del T V dot del C. Okay, so we know this equation. We have okay, so we have these equations. And what I want you to now tell me is what are the governing equations for fluid flow? So, what are the governing equations for fluid flow? Now, it's stroke and continuity. Perfect. So, now, it's strokes and continuity. So, we have del dot V is equal to zero. And minus, so I'll start with a full full equation and then we'll simplify this. Rho del u del v by del t plus v dot del v or minus grad p plus mu del square v plus rho g. Okay. So if you can solve all of these equations together, you have everything. You can do all the electrokinetic problems. Uh, and you basically essentially have you can solve anything you want, but this is obviously you can as you can see it's more complicated than the usual system because now we also have electric field to take care of. And there are multiple length scales, multiple time scales. It's a very, very notorious problem. Even just solving the yeah. yeah I, I will I will add. Yeah, so, so so these are the governing equations. Okay. So uh, now let me ask you a question, and I think that was what Rajeshi was saying is that when we're thinking about this flow problem, right? We have a balance of two forces, an electrostatic force and a hydro uh, and a hydrodynamic force. So before doing that, first all the electrokinetic flows tend to be, generally speaking, you can assume this to be zero because Reynolds number is small. Okay, so it's okay to call them Stokes flow. Okay, so they're Stokes flow equations. This, this is okay for electrokinetic flows. This is generally true. You don't have to worry about this left hand side. Okay, so that's the first thing. Now, what I was trying to ask was that for the for the electroosmosis problem that we were discussing, we have two forces we were talking about. One was the electrostatic force, and one was the uh, one was the uh, hydrodynamic or, or the shear stress force. So how do I see the electrostatic force in these terms? Is there an electrostatic force here that I can take care of? Any thoughts? How do you see anything in electrostatic here? No, right? We haven't added anything here. And that's where the correction comes in. Is that the fluid flow also gets modified now when you have electrostatic and what's the electrostatic force per unit volume charge is intense electric field okay so remember that electric force is electric force is equal to charge times electric field and so that's per unit volume becomes electric force per unit volume becomes charge density 
times electric field. And that's why you add a term here, minus rho E grad phi. And remember grad phi was the, was the, uh, is the uh, electric field or more commonly, this is known as minus grad P plus mu del square V plus rho G plus epsilon del square phi grad phi because rho E is related to epsilon del square phi through the Poisson equation. Okay, so you write it like this. So this is your modified Stokes equation while adding the electric force. Okay, so that's essentially what you need to solve in the equations. Make sense? Any questions, sir? So the final graphic version that you will see in the course is that you have added. So we started with sort of non-strokes. We have seen many, many times. Stokes equation you have also seen many times. But now we have a modified Stokes equation where we have a body force from the same side. So now what if my role is zero? My role is zero. This one will drop. Okay. If there is no electric field, let's say I'm just chilling and there is no electric field, then I don't have to worry about it. So this only comes when I have electrolyte, where we have a surface. So when we have a surface, we have a charge density is not zero. And when charge density is not zero, this is something else. And when you, you will see that you have a surface. Okay. So let's take a five minute break. Let's resume at 12.51. What we will do is we will use these equations to solve the problem that I mentioned earlier, which is the electroosmosis problem. And that will be the end of the, the last problem we'll do in course. Okay. 1251. <laughs> 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 So we will describe that in the next part. Basically, what it will be say that the electric field will have so that when I was in equilibrium, then what is double lift part will apply, and then the only new thing is the lift. So we will discuss that. We will be discussing. So, you're likely, likely to get any sort of, um, sort of on the left side of the uh, there is an interaction Yeah, 
All right, let's get started. It's 1251. Uh, so the objective is to find the electroosmotic velocity. So objective is to find electroosmotic velocity. Find electroosmotic velocity. Okay. Uh, and what we are really doing here is we are saying that we have a flat plate with some some potential zeta potential and we'll discuss what it is uh, zeta potential i'll describe what the zeta potential is in a second then we're applying some electric field ex in the x direction so this is x comma y here it's x this is why if zeta potential is positive, so let's say if this is positively charged, then we'll have negatively charged ions. They'll experience an electric field and set up some flow. Okay. The velocity far away from the surface, velocity far away from the surface, y going to infinity is what we want to calculate. It's called the electroosmotic velocity. Okay, is the x direction velocity far away from the surface is essentially called the electroosmotic velocity. Okay, that's what we want to find. This is objective is to find this number. Okay. Some assumptions and some of these assumptions are sort of you can show them more exactly, but I just want to reduce some of the work and kind of show you something. So it's basically we assume that Vy is equal to zero. It's a unidirectional flow. Okay. We have already made our life hard enough by adding this electrostatic force. So we just make it assume unidirectional flow, no y direction velocity. We will assume the zeta f by rt or the potential on the surface is small. Okay. So there's a linearized assumption. We don't want to solve the problem for large potentials. We will assume that the system is steady. The system is steady we'll make an assumption that n plus minus y is equal to zero. So no flux of ions in the y direction. And this is called the ideally blocking assumption. Okay, so you're saying that the ions are just not, they're not going to try to penetrate the surface anywhere. They're just not going to move in the y direction, the net transport. Okay, so the net transport in the y direction is zero. Okay. Then obviously our, we have some boundary conditions. I'll just mention here. Boundary conditions is Vx. Sorry, pressure is constant too. We are not applying any pressure. So pressure is constant. And so the boundary conditions are that Vx plus at y equal to zero is um, zero. There is no, no slip. Then Vx at y equal to infinity is u e zero. The electroosmotic velocity. So that's what we want to find. Is our object okay? So first, I want to clarify what what all things that are written here. So we have a liquid with some electrolytes in it, some charged surface. The oppositely charged ions get attracted to the surface. That's point number one. Okay. Now we apply an electric field that disturbs this system a little bit. Add the force on this liquid layer, which is charged. 
and to balance that charge, we set up a flow. Okay, so that's the setup. We will assume that there is no y direction velocity, so it makes life easy. We will assume the reader potential is small or the linear, linear limit steady system and no pressure in the y direction for the ions and pressure is constant. Okay, so these are our assumptions. This is the problem. And this is a very important problem. Like I said, people still use this. There are variations coming of this formula all the time. Like even like last five years, you will see like at least 50, 60 papers just on this topic. It was a very important topic for kind of, you know, analytical chemistry. So what's how, how do we even start this problem? So we'll start at the governing equations and try to slowly move up. But we'll make one more assumption. And this is more of an assumption, which is kind of like almost uh sort of physically motivated you can argue that my phi of x comma y okay is phi of equilibrium in the y direction minus e x times x and i'll explain why this is why why is this what i'm reading writing like this so what is this trying to say is that you the, the problem is saying that you're making the light more difficult by adding the electric field okay when there was no electric field, I knew the problem of double layer. I just solved it in the last lecture. We solved a double layer problem. We know Boltzmann distribution, capacitance, charge, everything, right? That's my equilibrium potential. But now I'm slightly perturbing it by adding this electric field. So that's kind of like called the weak field approximation. Is that that potential in the y direction is not going to be disturbed. That is going to stay like that. You are allowed to just add some variation in the x direction of this form. And I haven't dreamed this ex minus x. The idea is if you do del, f, del phi by del x, you get minus ex, which is the electric field that you have applied, or minus del phi by del x is ex. So all you are really saying is that you can keep the double layer like it is. You are not going to impact the double layer structure. All you're doing is just adding x direction. So this is the uh, like a constant which is like the amount of charge carried by an electron per, per unit mole. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Correct. So that's that's the idea that is saying that the double layer structure is not going to be impacted by this additional. This is a small, this is called the weak field, weak field approximation. That is just a very small electric field. Obviously, if you apply a very large electric field, your double layer should be impacted. But this is an assumption that this is, uh, you know, is going to happen. So this is sort of the last thing that you assume is this. Okay. Any questions on this? Yes. Um, P, P is constant. Pressure, yeah. yeah. Pressure. Yeah, please don't hesitate to ask. There are more variables now. So if there's any confusion, don't hesitate to ask. Pressure is not. Oh, a good question. So thanks for I forgot to mention no gravity. Yes. Thank you. Gravity is zero in the system. Okay. So think of it like a flat flat surface like this. So you can kind of charge here. Any any questions? Great questions, by the way. Please don't hesitate to ask me. Okay. So here now we have variables. So now we want to solve this problem. Governing equations. I hope I hope this is kind of love. You have seen in transport again and again. You start with governing equations, simplify them, boundary conditions, and so on. So first thing we have vx of x comma y vy of x comma y uh, concentration c plus minus of x comma y and phi of x comma y these are my variables right i can neglect this because i already know i already know what this value is this is equal to zero okay so don't forget that these are the variables you want to solve for eventually and so my equation is del Vx by del X plus del Vy by del Y is equal to zero. So I can just forget this. So I don't even need, no need to use continuity because, 
I mean, it can help. I mean, you don't have to. Let's let's let me make a life a little easier. Maybe I jumped a little bit. So this tells you that vx is only a function of y now, right? So if vx is basically this tells implies del v x by del x is equal to zero. Vx is a function of y. So continuity we have already used. Next equation is my Poisson Nernst Planck equation. Poisson Nernst Planck. And there are three equations here, right? Three equations here. So I have, uh, I have the, um, and by the way, there is also pressure of x comma y, which is constant. I should mention there's a sixth variable, which is constant. So now my question to all of you is, do I need to solve for the Nasa equation? There are three equations, they're coupled. Do I need to solve them? Or is there a way I can bypass all of them? And why? Any thoughts? Yes. So that's just the fact of the y direction. Um, yeah. And we're solving it. We, we have the uh, electric, the force, the electric force. Yeah. So the point is, as as Colin mentioned, is that this is a double layer problem. The Poisson Nernst Planck equations help you solve the double layer. We have just solved it in the x direction for the flat plate case. Now everything is just the plate is in this and the normal is in the y direction. So essentially, we don't have to necessarily reinvent everything. We know the equations. If the equations are d square phi equilibrium by dy square is equal to phi equilibrium by lambda square. Do you all agree that this is our, you know, this is our equation. We can just directly write it because this is the double layer equations don't change because we are just adding a small electric field on top of that. And then phi equilibrium of y comma zero, and it's only a function of y is zeta and phi equilibrium of y going to infinity is zero. Right? I don't have to solve this equation. I already know the value of phi equilibrium because uh, basically I just I had the same equations except this was phi d and this was x. So I know my phi equilibrium essentially becomes phi equilibrium becomes zeta into exponential minus y by lambda. It's an exponential decay of the zeta potential. I don't have to solve that equation. That makes my life much easier, right? Because I don't have to solve them. So I get this equation. So in your homework problem, by the way, yes, please, Noah, go ahead. Oh, it's equal. I mean, like, I mean, the limit we're talking about is equal. Y zero, that equal? Zeta potential, sorry. Yeah. Zeta. Yeah. This is the zeta potential on the surface, which is small. That's why I could use a linearized answer, right? That's why I, this is a linearized result, right? Equation. By the way, in your homework problem, you start with the same equation, but your boundary conditions are different. You have charge conditions on the two plates. It looks to your homework problem. So you just do the same thing, same answer. Vx is only a function of y. But the, this result will change. It will just become a function of y. It's a different function of y. I think it's a tan hyperbolic or something like that because the boundary conditions are different. That's all. Okay. And the, the boundary conditions are not potential, but of charge, which is what we discussed earlier in the, in the class. Okay. That's what you get. So you don't have to solve it. So any problem for electrokinetic flows, in the most simplest case, you don't have to solve it. It's just a double-layer problem. So you can use the double-layer equations and just solve that. Okay. Then the third part is our modified Stokes flow equation. Modified flow equation. So now we have this equation. So here, how many equations do I have for modified Stokes flow? So two, right? Vx and Vy. So continuity is already used. So we have Vx and Vy. Do I need an equation for Vy? No, I know it's zero everywhere. So it's just redundant. This equation doesn't matter. This goes away. So the only equation I really care about is Vx. 
and let's take a poll here look at your notes and try to tell me which what is the form of this equation modified stokes flow uh, and for now you can assume that the pressure i mean can vary which obviously con it's it's constant so you don't have to worry about this but what do you think it should look like what kind of uh, system would look like a modified stokes equation in the x direction right so take your time this is very important i want everybody to get this right uh, and think through it what do you think will look like okay. Take your time and give another 45 seconds. Yes. The B and D, so there is a slight difference in the second term. If you notice the argument in the second derivative, in the B is Vx by Vx square and Vy by Vy square. Here it's both Vx. Oh, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. So let's take another maybe 30 seconds. Let's let's give time. I want everybody to respond. This is an important, important problem. All right. Maybe last five seconds, 10 seconds for somebody to respond. All right, let's close the poll now and let's look at the results. Great. So most of you have it right. It is D. Uh, very good. Uh, this is very important because I want it to be, this, this is a good, good test of making sure you're carefully looking at the equations. There are some elements here is that this argument, which was the question was that it's a del square of Vx. So that's why the argument is Vx. But it's the Laplace of phi. So that's why you have the del square phi with the x square and y square, and then there's only greater than phi gets this. Yeah, this is not we are not simplifying this further, but yes, this is the equation that will come out. But yes, you're right. We'll, we'll, we'll drop some terms off now. Yes, please. Um, It's no, so this phi, good question again. So all these are very good questions. Phi, this is this phi. Phi equilibrium is a part of that phi. So this is the great question, by the way. So this is a very nice question. So this is this phi. We are not, we have not, this is the assumption we have made. We have not utilized it yet. But for the double layer, it's a phi equilibrium because double layer is not independent of that phi, right? It is independent of that electric field we apply, right? Okay, good, good question. So let's take this equation down, which is, minus del b by del x plus mu del square v x by del x square plus del square v x by del y square plus epsilon del square phi by del x square plus del square phi by del y square del phi by del x is equal to zero. Great. Okay, so this is our equation. This is what everybody kind of answered just in the poll. So now what happens to the first term? Pressure is constant. So zero. Then Noah was saying like Noah was saying that Vx is not a function of x. So this goes away, right? This also goes away. Now I want you to tell me what should this term be in terms of phi equilibrium and Ex. Del square phi. So phi, remember phi of x comma y is phi equilibrium of y minus ex times x, right? If I take the second derivative with respect to x, what should I expect? So does anybody agree? Is it zero? 
If you take the first derivative with respect to x, you get minus ex, which is constant. It's an electric field, which you apply far away. So this is equal to zero, right? So I can just drop this, right? Does everybody agree? Anybody who has a question here? Anybody has a question here? All good? All right. Then what is what happens to del square phi by del y square? So del phi by del y is only d phi equilibrium by dy. And del square phi by del y square is d square phi equilibrium by dy square. Or, and, and finally, note that this del phi by del x here, we have already found that this del phi by del x is minus ex, right? So essentially, what I get out is mu del square vx by del y square, and you can verify this, epsilon d square phi equilibrium by dy square ex. This is what you get out. Yes. So because Vx is only a function of y, that's a good point. This is not a del now anymore. This is a d. Good. Yeah, this is d. Absolutely. Now I want to do can you can you further simplify it without being any math? So great question and great uh, great, uh, great answer and that's actually correct. That's actually one step further than what I was thinking is that you want to combine these two derivatives. That's a great great point. We can do that and actually there is a more general solution which does not pose a lot of restrictions that exactly does that. But uh, the, the sort of more sort of let's say sort of a simpler version we would look at it is that we already know d square phi by d del, del square phi by del y square is phi equilibrium and lambda square. And we already know this from our solution is that this d square phi by d y square is phi equilibrium and lambda square. So you can substitute that and kind of make your life a little bit easier to solve this problem. I do want to note another thing here. This is exactly how we tried the problem. This statement is saying that if you apply an electric field, if the double layer has a charge, remember that this is some sort of a charge, right? This is a charge. Charge in double layer, in a way. And then maybe negative part is sign here and there. This is exactly what you find out. This is some sort of charge in the double layer. And, and if you apply an electric field, I will create a shear stress to balance it. So this math statement is the same physical statement we started with. That a charge in the double layer times the electric field balances the shear stress, right? And we can simplify this further by writing this as epsilon phi equilibrium by lambda square ex mu del square vx by del y square and phi equilibrium. And this is, we know what phi equilibrium is. We know this is epsilon zeta, epsilon zeta exponential minus y by lambda ex by lambda square. And you can integrate this out to find the results. And we know the integration. We know that Vx as x goes to 0, so the y goes to 0 is 0. And Vx infinity is ue naught. Okay. So could, could uh, Someone guess what kind of an exponent, what kind of velocity profile you will get out looking at the equation. This is something you have not seen before. This is an exponential velocity profile. So this is something you have not seen probably in your undergrad, like you have seen parabolic, cubic, but this is the first time you've seen exponential velocity profile. So you can solve this. I will leave it up to you to solve. 
So what comes out is Vx minus epsilon minus epsilon zeta Ex by mu into one minus exponential minus y by lambda. So you can just, this is very easy to integrate by the way, it's not, not difficult. This is what you get out and this term is ueo so ueo is minus epsilon zeta ex by mu okay. this is what you answer because when you put y equal to infinity this is what you get out when velocity y goes to infinity this is u the, the outside the term outside the bracket is what it means so when y equal to zero the exponential becomes one so you get out to be a zero velocity this is sort of like a velocity that almost approaches in an exponential form to that value this is probably the first time at least it was for me the first time seeing an exponential velocity profile all right now that's because of an electrokinetic process now just the one last thing before we close the lecture is the sign of the velocity so remember, this is a sign of the fluid, fluid flow. So it says it will be the it will be defined by the zeta potentials time electric field. And then there is a negative here. It's very confusing because there are three things that can change sign. So let's just take a look at them. So now the question is, will the velocity in this case be in the positive direction or in the negative direction? Look at the formula. Look at the formula. Zeta is positive. It's a positively charged sur surface. Electric field is positive because we are in the positive x direction. Then the flow will be in the negative direction. Isn't that odd? It looks feels odd, right? The flow will start to like it'll be like a velocity profile like this. Could somebody ex can someone explain me why it will be like this? Physically, we had discussed we had discussed that um, the electric force will be in this this direction, right? Electric force will be in this direction. But then why is the flow also happening in the left direction? Is that comes on. Like why is the flow also happening in the x direction? Negative x. Yeah. Absolutely, right? So because the wall is trying to pull it in this right direction, if the flow is happening towards the left, the wall, the force that the wall is applying on the on the fluid flow is in the positive x direction, right? Because know that we are doing a force balance on the fluid phase, fluid phase, right? So that's why it's the opposite of the zeta potential times the electric field. So the the drag force, basically, or the not a drag force, I would should say the hydrodynamic force is in this direction. The mu, the mu del v exponent y in this direction. So this is very important. This sometimes can be confusing. So just go back to the formula if you're confused. And I just want to mention one last final thing is that electrophoretic velocity, and that might sometimes be a little easier to see, when the particle is stationary, electrophoresis is epsilon zeta by mu ex uh, for lambda by a smaller than smaller than one, or the thin double layer limit, and this is a little easier to see. It's in the same direction as the zeta potential. It's the particle because you have not a negative sign because now the particle is moving. The velocity sign is just reversed. And this term is called the mobility, M. So if you remember the speaker who came last week had like the whole lecture was on this number M, how to calculate this number M and you know, what are different complexities of this. But this is a code for thin double layer and the famous result called by the Smolichowski slip. So if you are an electrophoresis, if you have ever done any zeta sizer, most of it use this Smolachowski slip relationship to calculate. However, it is not always valid. 
you may have to correct it for different systems. It is true when the, the limit is thin double layer and the particle is much bigger than the double layer. Okay. So today what we did was we discussed. So I just want to summarize all of this. That's end of the material for the course. So we started this electrolyte transport. We derived the poisson nusslang equation when electro neutral. We discussed the ambipolar diffusivity and the current becomes a resistance. And then when we have a surface charge, we discuss a double layer, Boltzmann distribution and how we write the boundary condition and it becomes like a capacitor. And then the third system we said, we'll now add flow to the system. Our Stokes equation gets modified by this extra electric force. And while solving, we don't forget the double layer derivation. We use a double layer derivation and simply at the end of the day, solve the Stokes equation in the X to calculate the velocity. Okay, so in your homework, you will do a different boundary condition. In your in your homework four and homework six problem five, you will do this problem with a different boundary condition. Problem four, you will do the capacitance with a different boundary condition. And problem three is also on the uh, distribution of double layer and so on. Okay, so that will give you a very good kind of broad coverage of what is in this broad area. Um, and then on Wednesday, we will basically resume and do a review uh, and just uh, kind of end the course. There, okay. So I'll have officers now, uh, and then Felipe will have officers on Wednesday. I'll also have officers on Wednesday for the homework and then Friday. And then I'll send out the link for Sunday for the, uh, for the exam. Okay. All right. Uh, that's it for today. And then we'll meet on Wednesday. And please do fill out the FCQs for those who haven't. Please do fill out the FCQs.